Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. This is episode 178 and the final instalment of all things 16th century women. I'm your host, Natalie Grinninger. Thank you so much for joining me today. Throughout August and September, we've been exploring the lives of 16th century women through a series of podcast episodes here on Talking Tudors and video lectures over on my YouTube channel. While all the content is freely available, I ask that you consider supporting the event by becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for all the details. I do hope you've enjoyed all the episodes and discussions around 16th century women. I have created a playlist on my YouTube channel that contains links to all 21 podcast episodes and lectures that I've published over the last two months. When you join the Talking Tudors patron family, you'll receive lots of Tudor-themed goodies, but you'll also get access to patron-only monthly giveaways. September's prize is a one-year subscription to Tudor Places magazine. You can find out more about them at TudorPlaces.com. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag #ILoveTalkingTudors. Now, on to today's episode, I'm excited that joining me on the show to talk about courtesans in 16th century Venice, namely Veronica Franco, is Professor Margaret Rosenthal. Margaret Rosenthal is Professor of Italian at the University of Southern California. A specialist in Italian Renaissance literature and women's social history of the Venetian Republic, she's published numerous articles and books on Renaissance women writers. The Venetian courtesan poet Veronica Franco has been a particular focus of her work. The honest courtesan Veronica Franco, citizen and writer of 16th century Venice by University of Chicago Press 1992, was awarded a National Book Prize from the Modern Language Association in 1994 and became the basis for both the Warner Brothers feature film Dangerous Beauty, released worldwide in 1998, and Dangerous Beauty the Musical, which premiered at the Pasadena Playhouse in 2011. She has also co-translated with Anne R. Jones poems and selected letters of Veronica Franco, University of Chicago Press, 98, and Clothing of the Renaissance World, Thames and Hudson, 2008, which is a translation from Italian into English of Cesare Vecellio's hugely influential 1590 costume book, documenting the uses of clothing in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the New World. Her current book project is a study of the uses of fashion and dress in 16th century illustrated Alba Amicorum friendship albums that were owned by university students throughout Europe. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Thank you. 
Welcome to Talking Tudors and all things 16th century women. Please introduce yourself to our listeners and just tell us a little bit about you and your background. Hi, my name is Margaret Rosenthal and I'm a professor of Italian at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I was born in Italy and spent a lot of my time there over the years. But when I discovered 16th century women, it took me to Italy even more often. Uh, but now I'm a little bit farther away in Los Angeles than I was when I first started working on her, which was as a graduate student at Yale University many, many years ago, of course, on the East Coast. I am a specialist in Italian Renaissance literature and women's social history of the Venetian Republic. And I've published many articles and, and a few books on the, in particular, on the courtesan Veronica Franco. Veronica Franco was a courtesan poet. And so the first book that I wrote, The Honest Courtesan, um, it has a longer title. It um, was published in 1992. And that really is a kind of a mixture of a biography and a social history about women in the 16th century in Venice and also throughout um, different parts of Italy, talking in relation to Veronica Franco. And then that brought me to realize that it would be very good to actually have an edition of Veronica Franco's poems and uh, letters. And so with a colleague of mine and a person with whom I've worked for on another book as well, Anne Jones, we decided to publish and translate all of Veronica Franco's poems. And it was uh, an important addition because it went into a series called The Other Voice. And it's a, it's, it's a series, a publishing series in you know, the United States, which has transformed the landscape of making available women's writing to a general public. And then we published um, and we and translated a number of her letters. She, had, she wrote 50 letters, but we translated uh, about half of that number. And then in most recent years, I've been uh, turned to the clothing and dress and fashions of uh, women in the, in the Venetian Republic. And uh, because of my fascination with courtesans, they were often trendsetters and important with regard to clothing and the ways they use clothing. And so in order to understand clothing better, I once again translated together with Anne Jones, one of the most important costume books of the early modern period, and that is Cesare Vecellio's book that we've translated as Clothing of the Renaissance World. His costume book dealt with all of Europe, Africa, Asia, and the New World. So that's a book that is very important also for understanding what the subject is that I'm going to be talking about today, because he mentions courtesans quite often in that book. Wonderful. Thank you. I have to make a note of all those um, books, uh, <laughs> even though every month I say, okay, that's it. I'm not purchasing any more no, books. No, and no. of course, I <laughs> end up, you know, buying several more. So before we, we go in and dive in and talk about sort of specifics about courtesans and in particular about Veronica Franco, can you tell us a little bit about what a courtesan actually is and when this group of women emerges in Italy? So it's actually a difficult question to say what a courtesan is because it depends um, really a lot on which part of Italy we're talking about and they really emerge for the first time in Italy. But I'll do my best to, to give you a sense of who they are. They're really a kind of new player on the aristocratic scene, very different from the court lady very different from women who uh, you know, are sequestered in their homes and even though of the upper class really don't have very much of a public voice. The courtesan and the, the term that I used for the book was the honest courtesan, but I think a better term is an honored courtesan. So the highest sort of level of the courtesan profession, she emerges and she really captures the attention of the aristocratic milieu and imagination of her period. And why and how this happened has occasioned really a lot of speculation on the part of historians uh, who want to try to figure out where it first happened. And a lot of thinking, or one hypothesis is that she entered into the one of the first important all-male courts, which was the 15th century papal court, when the papacy returns to Rome. And there, you know, she's got, there's this all male clientele. It's a vibrant court, completely dominated by men, and most of whom are unmarried. It's a perfect opportunity for a courtesan uh, to establish herself in a sort of separate but parallel sphere of influence. So that is possible that that's where it comes or where she first emerges. 
But I would say that although courtesans were all over Italy and Europe, one of the most accepting places was the uh, Venetian Republic. And that was true for a lot of people, other people, other professions, uh, people. So it was a very diverse, multicultural and sort of melting pot. And the courtesan, you know, is a, a woman who is famed and for her wit, for her beauty, for her, even her wealth at a certain point. And particularly this, as, the, as Italy becomes more and more of an aristocratic society in the uh, 15th and 16th century, it's also her sophistication of dress and, uh, and the other sort of arts of performing, for example. Um, many courtesans were virtual, say they were singers, and they would often accompany themselves on the spinet or on the lute. She would be able to improvise music to poetry that is orally recited. She was very well versed in literature of uh, antiquity, not necessarily able to read, the ancient languages, but she would have re read the ancient authors in the vernacular translations. She often uh, as well sat for endless portraits of women. And although we can't be certain that it's in exactly a courtesan, we can see from the demeanor of the portrait or the, the ways in which she's using her body to express herself as a sexual person, a sensual person, uh, we often think of the courtesan. The other thing that's really important about the courtesan as a way of differentiating herself from other women of the period who are equally interested in um, self-presentation and the arts and so forth and patronage. Uh, she was not any of those things. She was not a patron, but she used her private home if she was at the sort of higher levels as a place for others to meet so that she didn't have to necessarily depend on a patron to make his home available to her, although she does have a patron, and I'll talk about that. But she actually uses her own home. And so this home becomes very sumptuous, very well furnished. She would have had servants and maids who assist her at home. And they also assist her in just circulating in public spaces because her clothing was so, so, <laughs> so extravagant at times. And also the shoes that she wore were often very high. And so she would have needed people to sort of carry her about either literally as she's walking so she won't fall or in a litter, which was a handheld carriage that would take her through the city. So she had these courtly ways and she'd absolutely through this, although not sort of attached to any specific court, she was very much a public figure and therefore constantly judged by others, observed by tourists, observed by tra travelers, anyone who was anyone who goes to Venice wants to see a courtesan and wants to connect with her. Uh, but it's also true that many cities particularly Rome, going back to Rome, also saw the courtesan at a lower level as the epitome of, of a shameful woman, right? And so they would often try to ridicule them, sequester them, put them in certain parts of the city, particularly in Rome, get them out of town if they could in certain moments. Whereas in Venice, although there was some of that happening in the earlier, in the 15th century, by the 16th century, they kind of let let it go. <laughs> the laws of putting her in a in a specific part of the city that they were trying to do so as to keep her uh, separate from other people, that didn't last for very long. And therefore, uh, she was very much a, a public presence. People saw her, she mingled with other women, and the women were often those who assisted her, as I said before, or who were poets of, in their own right. But it was crucial that the courtesan, in order to survive, in order to flourish, she had to have a patron. And in that way, the word courtesan really does conjure up the note, the word courtier, because both, if you think about it, both courtier and courtesan, courtier being more the male artist, intellectual, poet, so forth, was also dependent on patrons. And so he, it was crucial for him to have someone who would bring him financial support and, a, and a, a continuous salary. Similarly, the courtesan really depended upon a patron. And it was without a patron, she would not have survived on her own. This whole idea of 
going it alone for as a woman would have been extremely difficult, particularly as a courtesan. So when she eventually is able to secure a patron, uh, that is after she, you know, more in her late 20s, early 30s, that patron stays with her as a patron for her whole life. And when he dies, which it is about 10 years before she does, she loses everything. Everything in the sense of a, you know, she's also an older woman by this point, and she's in her late 30s, early 40s, which was old at the time. But uh, without his, his continual support, she, the last 10 years of Franco's life, Veronica Franco, who we're going to speak of as, as the sort of the star of the courtesan's profession is really without any uh, security in her life. So the last 10 years of Veronica Franco's life, I know very, very little about her. Um, and I think it's, and that's all explained um, as we go along, um, what the reasons for that as well, other reasons. Thank you. That was a wonderful summary of the of the courtesan. So you you mentioned there that they're a very public figure, that people are always wanting to see them, watching them, judging them. So can you tell us a little bit more about how these women were viewed? And, and let's stick with 16th century Venice, the Venetian Republic, just to, to make it a little bit more specific. Well, I, I love to talk about it, the Venetian Republic, because it is a kind of a mixture of a very liberal society as well as a very structured one. And so it's a good breeding ground for the courtesan. As far as talking about how they're viewed, it really depends on who's doing the viewing. And so my answer is going to be a little bit long because there are so many facets to that question as uh, who's doing the viewing. If it's other courtesans, we know very little about how they viewed each other. They don't write about it very much. It's not uh, part of this sort of public discourse. So how they actually saw each other as a group is hard to say. There must have been jealousies and, and intrigues among them, and they certainly were, there were. And if you go into the courts and look at the trials or the denunciations, I'm sure you'll find a lot of courtesans, you know, who are vying with one another. But in the literature, which is what I study as the courtesans who wrote literature, they don't speak about each other very, very much. But who does speak about the courtesan a lot? Are, are the men with whom she was vying for support and attention and power. And, and these men were often other poets. They could also be members of government who are also literary figures. And, and they tended to uh, view her as a real threat. Uh, they saw her as someone with whom they had to vie for all kinds of support once she became well considered. And she would have run across these people quite often because Venice was a kind of a, a city that allowed for this kind of pliable structure where you walking the streets, there weren't separate neighborhoods that are clearly distinguished one for the other according to social rank. She would have met people on the street. She would have seen um, uh, in this, these, um, this walking city, she would have um, seen them in boats and she would have inter interacted with them. It was a very elastic urban makeup, uh, which a lot had to do was that there was no sort of central umbrella structure to the city, uh, apart from San Marco, of course, which was the city of government. But she would see people in the market, she would have seen people, uh, other individuals in the marketplace. And in fact, one traveler to the Republic says that, and I'll just quote, he says, gentlemen and greatest senators will come into the market and buy their flesh, fish, fruits, and such other things as are necessary for the maintenance of their family. This just astonished this English traveler. This just doesn't happen. <laughs> um, and in uh, English hierarchical society. Um, uh, so those same people that she would have interacted with in this more informal way, often then become the ones who view her with a lot of skepticism. They're critical of her when they felt, as I said, somewhat threatened by her. And um, once she becomes a real star, once the courtesan makes it her way up, and then I, I use Ronka Franco as an example of that, um, they see her as both a, an attraction because she is so well 
put together and so capable of conversation and so unlike the, the married woman who is confined to a domestic sphere. And when she starts, for example, the courtesan starts um, exchanging poetry or performing in salons or academies, uh, then the perception of her really starts to become very, very vexed. And it can be either enormously appreciated, for example, by the Venetian Republic, whenever they have any annual festivities or entries of foreign rulers into the, into the city, they'll trot out the courtesan because she's so, so much of an allure. But then when times get hard, when times get hard, when Venice undergoes every decade a bout of the plague, for example, or some kind of downturn in the, in the economic splendor of the city or lack thereof, she then becomes the scapegoat. And she's then, the way she's viewed is as, as someone who has brought the city down. And now, well, all of a sudden, all of that that had been championed before topples and she becomes the scorn of, of the aristocracy and, uh, and others who, who want to get rid of her, just don't want her to be their uh, competition. So you talked, Margaret, earlier about the honest courtesan you called it or the honored courtesan so can you tell us and you've already obviously covered a little bit of this and what you've been saying but was there anything else you wanted to say about the difference between the honored or honest courtesan and other sex workers that are that are in the area one of the things that happens is that there is no strict legal definitions of the different workers they try to every city tries to but it doesn't somehow work and it's because of the male clients. I mean, this is the problem of prostitution, right? It's that the male clients want her and they, and they don't want her to be her mobility or and availability to be hampered. It, so as a result, it's very hard to say exactly what the differences are, but I can say that uh, the largest difference is her wealth her social status, her style of life, which is really much, much closer to the, as I said, the courtier or the, or the someone who has uh, uh, just made his way or her way up the social ladder based on talent and skills. But there was a kind of social hierarchy of prostitution, nevertheless. There were those who lived in, on the street that would have been the very lowest uh, level and those would be the people who were often dubbed the word was putana in Italian and then that of course would be whore then above that meditrice is a woman who lived more likely in a bordello kind of environment with other other prostitutes and then she is called a, a prostitute and then the honored courtesan is someone who has achieve the level of excellence where the, she can pick and choose whether she actually prostitutes the body or not, in other words, or sells the body or not. So by that point, she has patrons, but the patrons aren't dependent upon that transaction. And Veronica Franco, if I may, just for a moment, um, has this wonderful moment in one of her poems where she's talking to a man who obviously wants to have sex with her. And she is saying to him that there's much more to her than that. And so she says, such an act doesn't suit my profession, but I want to see, and I say it clearly, your love in deeds instead of words. You know well what I most cherish. Behave in this way, as I've already told you, and you'll be my special matchless lover. My heart falls in love with virtues and you who possess so many of them that in you all the finest wisdom dwells. Don't deny me your effort in such a great cause. Let me see you longing in this way to acquire a lover's claim upon me. So she's saying, you know, the sexual transaction is just a very small part of what it is that I offer. I offer so much more than that. And when she says, I want deeds, what she's really saying is I want to enter into an exchange of poetry with you so that you actually say, I am writing a poem with an honored courtesan, right? I'm telling the public that I am doing that. And uh, that was a very, very hard one kind of statement for a courtesan. 
it was fine for the men, the aristocratic men with whom she interacted to enjoy her company and her wit and her conversation and their music and so forth. But it was not considered a good idea to affiliate with a named courtesan in print and to make it public in that way. And so let's think more about Veronica Franco. She sounds absolutely intriguing. I can see why you've been so intrigued by her. So what do we know of her early life? Maybe a little bit about her education, her family. Are there many sources that tell us about that? Yes. Um, So there are not many, but those that we have are very rich for the biographer insofar as Let me just start um, by answering what we know about her early life. She was born in Venice into a family that was of native born citizens, what they call cittadini originari, citizens. So she wasn't of the higher class and she wasn't of the very low. It would be the middle register of society. And those citizens are those ones who made up the Venetian government, bureaucracy, um, and the religious confraternities, for example. So this, I think, was a boon for her. Now, she was the daughter of a courtesan, but her mother was at a much lower level than anything that Franco uh, was, you know, never achieved what she did. Uh, we know her name, Paola Fracasa, and uh, she would have continued to be a courtesan, the mother, and even during the time that Veronica was young. Um, she was the only daughter, Franco. Uh, there were three boys in the family. And we know the names of her, the the immediate family, through her wills. So this is one of the most uh, important archival sources for anyone studying women writers or women in in the uh, early modern period. Because every time a woman was pregnant, this is what she did. She would write her will. And the will reveals a great deal about the person even when they're very young and have very little to, you know, to leave in the world. But what we learn about Franco is that, for example, that her mother had been a courtesan. We also learn that her father is is absent in her life. And we also find out that she was married off by her mother to a doctor, even though a courtesan. So she was, the mother had trained the daughter to become a courtesan, but it's pretty clear that why would she marry her off to this man? Most likely because the mother is worrying about her old age that will be coming. And so she needs the daughter to be well situated. And so in the wills, we also know that that marriage did, it happened, but it didn't last because Veronica asks for her dowry back in one of the wills that she leaves. And with the dowry, of course, would have come all of the special things, all of the items of the dowry that she would have wanted it as part of her uh, her economic stability. She also had six children in her life, but three of them die in infancy, but she supports the other three. They were all by different men and she supports them through their, their lives. Unfortunately, I could never find anything about them because the paternity of the, it was never revealed. She alludes in her wills to men with whom they might, but she doesn't say always that that is the father. Although in one case she does, and uh, I tried everything. He was someone who lived in Ragusa, which would be today's uh, Dubrovnik, and would have been a merchant probably coming and going to Venice. And I tried very hard to find out using his name, something about the son, but was never very successful. So these are her early days. Those early days, she would have been dependent. Once the, the husband is gone, she would have been dependent on having sexual relations for a high fee with the elite of Venice and with many kinds of travelers who come to the city. But that, I think, becomes less important, as I say, when she meets um, and secures the patronage of a man named Domenico Venier. In terms of her career as a courtesan, it sounds like the training started quite early. Can you tell us a little bit more about this role that her mother plays in training her to be a courtesan? So the mother would have taught her how to dress. And because the courtesan would have spent a lot of her day getting dressed. (laughs) The clothing that, you know, without servants, it would have been, until she had them, it would have been quite onerous. And as you know, the the clothing of the period is, is, is all mix and match parts. So the sleeves are detachable, the ruff is detachable, the skirt is detachable, all of the different aspects of this very elaborate costume. And so 
so the mother would have taught her how best to dress and how to do that. And so that would have been a part of the training. The other is all of the different etiquettes of a noble woman, how to walk, how to conduct a, a decorous conversation, and, and to have a modicum of uh, education, which Franca was fortunate that she had brothers because those brothers would have bought books home and she would have, uh, they would have had tutors and she would have been able to profit indirectly from all of that. She would not have been able to go to school. No girls went to school unless they were a part of a family business. And then they might have learned um, you know, enough mathematics to be able to, to do the sums and keep the account books and so forth. So the mother would have taught her those things. And then the danger, though, of the mother and Franco writes a letter later on when she becomes a writer, um, is that the mother might have been doing it for the wrong reasons. The danger of an ex-prostitute, ex-courtesan mother teaching the daughter the profession and being her pimp, which is really what happened in the early days. One has to ask you know, what was her motivation in doing this and what did it mean for Franco? And so I think as soon as Franco can separate from the mother and have her own house and her own milieu, um, she's probably better off. But Later on, I was saying that she writes this letter to a mother who wants to make her daughter into being a courtesan. And it is an absolutely, you know, just extraordinary denunciation of the mother who Franco suspects is doing it for, as I say, for all the wrong reasons to just sort of benefit on the back of her daughter. And in the letter, she says, you know, she in doing when she accuses the mother of this, because this was a friend of hers who had come to Fran to Franco to ask her to help her uh, make her daughter into a courtesan. Franco writes, and if I may, can I read you yes, what she please. says to her? Yes. You know how once I've begged and warned you to protect her virginity. And since this world is so full of dangers and so uncertain, and the houses of poor mothers are never safe from the amorous maneuvers of lustful young men. I showed you how to shelter her from danger and to help her by teaching her about life in such a way that you can marry her decently. I offered you all the help I could to assure that she'd be accepted into the Casa delle Zitelle, which was a charitable home to shelter poor unmarried girls so that they didn't become forced into prostitution. And I also promised you, if you took her there, to help you with all the means at my disposal as well. At first you thanked me and seemed to be listening to me and to be well disposed toward my affectionate offer. Together we agreed on what needed to be done so that she'd be accepted there. And we were about to carry out our plan when you underwent, I don't know what change of heart, where once you made her appear simply clothed with her hair arranged in a style suitable for a chaste girl with veils covering her breasts and other signs of modesty. Suddenly, you encouraged her to be vain, to bleach her hair and paint her face. And all at once you let her show up with curls dangling around her brow and down her neck, with bare breasts spilling out of her dress, with a high uncovered forehead and every other embellishment people use to make their merchandise measure up to the competition. What is Franca doing here? She's describing a courtesan. She's describing herself in a, and other women, but who are courtesans. But she's saying the worst part of it isn't the actual, the way the courtesan wears a dress or the fact that the breasts are out of It's that the mother has taught her to do these things in order to sell her. That's what angers Franca more than anything else. Because later on in that same letter, I'll just read you one more passage which sort of um, really explains what it is that she's saying. She says at one point, don't allow the flesh of your wretched daughter not only to be cut into pieces and sold by you, but you yourself to become her butcher. And, and then she says at another point in the letter, this wonderful denunciation of, I think, or explanation of what the dangers of prostitution are for someone who doesn't really have the abilities that a courtesan will need. And so she's very ruthless in her sort of assessment of this daughter as well. And she says, to make oneself pray to so many men at the risk of being stripped, robbed, even killed, so that one man one day may snatch away from you everything you've acquired, 
from many over such a long time, along with so many other dangers of injury and dreadful contagious diseases. To eat with another's mouth, sleep with another's eyes, move according to another's will, obviously rushing toward the shipwreck of your mind and your body. What greater misery? What wealth? What luxuries? What delights can outweigh all of this? Believe me, among all the world's calamities, this is the worst. So one could interpret that as, is she sort of recanting her life? No, I don't think so. I think what she's saying is, I didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And the mother is very you know, important in this regard because the mother is not giving her a choice. Yes, isn't it and wonderful to have that, that insight into her interior kind of life? That's incredible. And it's one of the moments where I say to myself, thank goodness I have it because she doesn't allow it very often. But the letter form that she writes in does provide us a glimpse into how she feels, but in the interior, but also how she wants everybody else to feel because it's so dramatic and, and so visually oriented that you can't but just sit back and say, oh, well, you know, that's just uh, pretension or whatever. You have to feel some compassion on some level or some involvement in that description, right, of the courtesan's life. And do you think you could give us a little taste of what uh, life was like for, for Veronica Frank on other, the honoured and coveted courtesans? Yes, I think it was a very rich life, as, despite what we've just heard. It's not a life just of sexual um, transactions. In about the uh, 1570s, uh, so she was born in, in the 40s, so she... 46, so she would have been in, as I say, in about her 30s. She meets Domenico Venier and she becomes a part of his literary salon in Venice. And he served her as a literary advisor. So a courtesan who is successful as a writer or as a musician, once again, like I've, I've said before, could only succeed with a male patron, couldn't have really managed alone in that world. And what's extraordinary about Franco is that we have her poems and letters, which she published in her lifetime, which is so unusual for women writers in the early modern period is we have to wait until their, their poems finally appear and then they're published, God knows how many centuries later, right? Or they're published just in little bits and pieces. But in the case of Franco, we have a full collection of her poems. We have her letters. And she's the only woman in the, in the years in which she publishes the letters to have published a volume of letters in the vernacular. Her world would have been very much uh, surrounding herself with other poets. Uh, she received a few commissions to put together collections of sonnets, one that was to commemorate a man of the Venetian elite who had been a military hero. And that is also a first, very, very unusual, not only for a woman to put together a such a collection of sonnets about a very male profession, but a courtesan to do that, that, that was really very, very noteworthy and important moment in her life. And then she, and then there, she does another collection of sonnets. She acts as a kind of editor or a convener of, of, of male poets together in this other's collection as well. So her intellectual life, her artistic life, is, uh, is what occupies most of her life. And with that come many dangers, actually. Mm -hmm. And as I alluded to before, so many uh, men who want to take her down and where better to do it is in the print medium. Mm -hmm. So just as much as she was able to create a reputation for herself, she has to now deal with numbers of poems that are being written about her, that are circulating in the Venetian Republic, in these salons, and they are trying to make her into the epitome of a filthy, immoral woman. And then at a certain point in her own home, the male tutor of her children files denunciations against her because she has uh, gone away from the home uh, during the plague to sort of save herself. And when she comes back to the house, she discovers that all of her items of her dowry have been stolen. And uh, I think this male tutor is a kind of preemptive strike. He, he denounces her denounces her before she denounces him. And what it, it leads to eventually is that she's brought to 
the Inquisition courts on charges of witchcraft uh, because he claims that in order for her to find her lost goods, she performed these magical incantations in her house and that she used virginal children to say the, the chants and she used the holy water from the local church. And by the way, he says she doesn't go to, she's eating meat on Fridays and she's not going to mass. And so he pulls out absolutely every, every possible slur that one can use. And she does go through these hearings in which she has to defend herself. Luckily, she does have this patron who helps her behind the scenes because she's eventually let off and, and the charges are, are not brought against her, but it does mean she's just come off the pedestal of enormous success, and it's very, very hard to recover from. So the dangers of being a high-level courtesan are, you know, are, are many. She talks about sexually transmitted diseases, but that's the only time she says that. Uh, but she does encounter in her own poetry other men, um, men with whom she's exchanging poems that they will, in fact, use this opportunity to, to write these scurrilous, filthy, obscene, really disgusting poems about her. And this leads her uh, to defend herself in her poetry, which is what makes them so wonderful. You hear her voice against all odds. Uh, she, she talks about, she talks of herself as a warrior, as an Amazon warrior, who's going to defend the women of, her, of the world against such you know, merciless treatment. And some of her best poetry is, uh, is about engaging with, with a male poet who she actually, in her volume of poems, engages with someone who she suspects has written these poems. And she defends herself in it's just an enormously vibrant and um, you know, groundbreaking way. That is so extraordinary. And so many of the, the discussions I've had over the last two months about 16th century women, the thread has, has come up so many times, or the theme that we are lacking their own voice, that we're, we're seeing these women through the lens of men, how men see them. And, and, and you're telling me that we've got her actual voice. And I find that just so refreshing and so amazing. It is. It is because of the tradition. I mean, this is where Franco has kept my interest for much of my adult life, even though I've gone on to other, other projects. I keep coming back to her because of this enormous courage and ability to talk directly to the male. In her volume of poems, there's 25 poems, but a good number of them are actually male poets writing to her and she's writing back to them and responding to them. There's at least seven like that. And, and her voice is either very combative or very critical of their poetic style, or she's very unwilling to fall into any of the stereotypes of the silent woman that, you know, the Petrarchan love poem where the woman never says anything and he just mourns the fact that the, his beloved is unattainable, haughty, cruel, and ruined his life. But she doesn't do that. She does. She makes it a much more active exchange. It's a dialogue. And she says, okay, these are the things that are really important to me and you don't really measure up. <laughs> so for example, she'll start one of her poems where she's suspecting that this man is her, is the man who's been uh, circulating these poems anonymously against her. No more words to deeds, to the battlefield, to arms. For resolve to die, I want to free myself from such merciless mistreatment. Should I call this a challenge? I don't know, since I'm responding to a provocation. But why should we duel over words? If you'd like, I will say that you've challenged me. If not, I challenge you. I'll take any route, and any opportunity suits me equally well. Yours be the choice of place or of arms, and I will make whatever choice remains. Rather, let both be your decision. At once, I am sure you will realize how ungrateful and faithless you have been, and how wrongfully you have betrayed me. And then she goes on and she shows, you know, just how she's going to, to take him on. And then she doesn't forget the fact that she's a courtesan, and that she, the arts of loving and all of that are part of her world. But she's playing on the metaphor of the pen. So the pen becomes the phallic symbol for the male, but for her, it's her weapon of choice, uh, rather than the sword. And so she says, 
Come here and full of most wicked desire, brace stiff for your sinister task. Bring with daring hand a piercing blade. Whatever weapon you hand over to me, I will gladly take. And also, especially if it's sharp and sturdy and also quick to wound. So it's, you know, a very kind of phallic image. Of, and then she says at the very end of this very long poem, she says, perhaps I would even follow you to bed and stretch out there in skirmishes with you. I would yield to you in no way at all to take revenge for your unfair attack. I'd fall upon you and in daring combat as you two caught fire defending yourself, I would die with you, felled by the same blow. So she brings in at the end this, this imagery of death and, of course, death being a, a, a way of speaking about orgasm, right, and of, of achieving a kind of sexual pleasure in her own act of besting him yes. <laughs> in this role. And so she says, you know, maybe that would be what would happen. So, so she never forgets that she's a courtesan, but it becomes less important in certain poems and more important in others, uh, but she's never um, apologetic about her, uh, about her profession. And then, in fact, so much so that she wants to inspire other women to follow in her footsteps and to have the courage as well to do that. And so she writes, um, and this is the last quote I'll, I'll read, but I think it's such an extraordinary moment where she says, in what way she wants to be a model for them. So here now she's writing to the man that she's discovered who is, she now knows is her real attacker. And she goes in another poem to describe exactly why he's not a good poet and why he shouldn't have attacked her. And now he, she's laying into him and explaining exactly what were the problems if in the whole, the whole dynamic between them. But she ends it by saying this, I do not know if you think it's a trifling risk to enter the field to joust with a woman. So she's using the whole idea of the duel, right? That what's happened is a kind of a duel. And he's like, he's a chivalric knight, he thinks, but she, but she says, you're far from one. <laughs> I do not know if you think it's a tri trifling task to enter the field to joust with a woman. But though you once fooled me, I warn you now. That if on one hand, it might be unseemly for a strong man to contend with a woman, on the other, it's thought a weighty event. When we women too have weapons and training, we will be able to prove to all men that we have hands and feet and hearts like yours. And though we may be tender and delicate, some men who are delicate also are strong. And some, though coarse and rough, are cowards. Women so far haven't seen this as true, for if they'd ever resolved to do it, they'd have been able to fight you to the death and to prove to you that I speak the truth among so many women I will act first, setting an example for them all to follow. On you who are so savage to us all, I turn with whatever weapon you choose with the hope and the will to throw you to the ground. And I undertake to defend all women against you who despise them so that rightly, I am not alone to protest. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And you get a real sense of her personality, don't you, through her, her writing. And the thing that I love about it also is that it's not just about her. It's about we. So here she has spent most of her life trying to establish this reputation as the honored courtesan. And of course, that makes her an individualist. It makes her an entrepreneurial. It makes her separate from other women. But... In this poem, and then in her wills, um, as I was saying, that's the most important, one of the most important sources I have. She leaves money to women. She leaves money to women who might be at risk. She sees, she's concerned about their future. She wants to make sure that charitable institutions exist for them to be protected if they need to be. She tries, she even asks um, to be able to found a new home for women, uh, particularly women who already have children, and she doesn't want them to feel that they have to desert their children in order to be taken care of. So she asks that the home be a place where they can bring their children to the home. So she has this benevolent ability to look beyond herself. And think in the we plural in a time of great distress for her, uh, her own person. 
And you you were talking earlier about the fact that courtesans are also seen as these sort of fashion trendsetters and the work mm. that you're doing in that area that sounds intriguing as well. So can you tell us just a little bit about the ways that clothing in this period have the power to, to communicate so much information but also enforce, you know, manners, customs, etiquette, all that kind of thing? So the courtesan basically is interested in looking like a high-level woman of society so the clothing that she wears is very close to the noble woman what's very astonishing about the noble woman in the time that Veronica Franco would have been wearing her most sumptuous gowns were that the noble women were bearing their breasts just as much as the courtesans it was a style and but they would bear the breasts sometimes literally all the way down but they would cover it with veils and so the, so the women, the noble women were doing this, the courtesan does it. She manipulates the dress codes that are considered suitable for the women of the nobility to, to her own tastes and her own personhood, right? And what she wants to communicate. But what is different is that it's how she wears the clothes. It's not what she wears. She will remove the veil. She will take up her skirt to show that, in a place where, you know, that she might not, shouldn't be doing this, she'll pick up the skirt and reveal that she's wearing breeches underneath the skirt, which also suggests that she's appealing to more than one men who might be less interested in women should become more interested in in them. She raises her veil when a woman in public would, a noble woman might lower it so as to seem modest, um, chaste. The courtesan, by necessity in public, has to put up her veil so that people can see her, so that they know who she is, that they can identify her. But it's also a way of sort of saying, I am a courtesan as well. I, I'm not just a, a beautifully dressed noble woman, right? And um, all of these gestures are erotic in connotation underneath the skirt. And many of the costume books that were printed often had, or um, or the manuscripts uh, that were albums that would circulate with clothing in them, had flaps that you could, uh, you'd see the courtesan's dress, and then you could take a flap and put it over, and then underneath it, you'd see these enormously high shoes, or you'd see the breeches underneath. Uh, So it was what she concealed which was sexy and seductive. Uh, You also um, will see, for example, little miniatures that were sold in this time to tourists and travelers. And you'll see courtesans in carriages and they'll be wearing masks, but then they'll take the mask off, right? To reveal, you know, reveal who they are. Uh, The other thing that would have differentiated the courtesan a little bit though, from the the noble woman is uh, the color choices. So the color choices of the fabrics would go into other tonalities that didn't necessarily signify nobility or aristocracy, right? You know, like the reds and the purples and those things. She would wear things maybe just because she thought they were a more beautiful combination of colors. So she would put it with green together with a little bit of gold, with a little bit of beige, with a, you know. And then she would have a maybe different um, combinations of fabrics, just to show that she was a woman with great taste and uh, an ability to choose rather than just accept the sort of standard noble woman's dress, right? There would be these wonderful combinations. And then if she couldn't actually afford those things herself, if she ever fell upon hard times or or she was just want, you know, didn't have the money right at the time to buy the, the, the clothing she needed for whatever reason, she could rent them. She could rent different parts of the clothing in these marketplace, at the marketplace or in auction houses, or actually in locations where clothes for rent were sold. And so she always had this opportunity to sort of mix and match the clothing that she wore. And it, it just, it stands out. Once you start looking, as I have at these different albums uh, that are colored or the costume books that are colored, you start to see the, the nuance of subtlety and elegance and refinement of the courtesan's dress that's quite different from the more sumptuous, you know, heavily ornate brocades and furs and so forth that the aristocratic women wore. 
And just to to bring our conversation to a to a close, Margaret, what can you tell us about Franco's later years? You've already alluded that there was some challenges there, and that she does come off that pedestal at some point. And her death in fifteen ninety one. Can you tell us a little bit about that period? We really, really know uh, very, very little. Uh, there's a tax report that I was able to find in fifteen eighty two, and unfortunately. It's revealing of what happens to a lot of courtesans, even someone as distinguished as Franco. Um, and that says that she's living in a area where a lot of poor prostitutes go to die mm-hmm. and uh, that she's living there. And then it's as if to suggest that, you know, that she has very, very little money at this point. Uh, also, as I said before, it coincides with her, the death of her patron. And so I think in the last, from what I can tell, in the last 10 years of her life, she's in a downward spiral uh, and we know very little. And that's because the things that she's up to are probably diminished, um, even though she gets off of the, without too much um, rebuke at the uh, Inquisition court, she's still a scarred person from that experience of public humiliation. She's lucky that she isn't actually humiliated publicly where some courtesans were who were brought to trial, but none of them were ever put to death. And that's a mistake that's made a lot that people, you know, that if you were brought before the Inquisition on charges of witchcraft, you were immediately killed. Well, that was not at all the case, but you were publicly humiliated in one way or another, and it could mean just um, having to wear a mitre and stand in the uh, public space or worse being dragged through the the city but she doesn't have any of that happening to her but I think the the public humiliation amounted to uh, just having no no wherewithal to sort of rebuild her career at that point she's too old and too tired and probably just uh, very without resources it's also possible, though, that there is a whole group of documents out there that some student or archivist uh, one day will find, and that those last 10 years of her life, we just haven't been able to tap into because we don't quite know where to look. Because an archive, you know, is, is a very complex mechanism, and you have to know sort of what you're looking for in order to even make it work for you. So there is a possibility that there's still materials out there and that we're going to learn a lot more about her and what how other courtesans fare toward the end of their life. Well, I certainly hope so. She sounds absolutely extraordinary. And I'm so grateful that you made the time to come on the podcast and tell us about this incredible woman that perhaps a lot of people have never heard of. So I think it's really exciting that now people are going to be excited and looking into her life. (laughs) So Margaret, just before I let you go, because I've kept you on here for for quite some time, uh, where can listeners find out more about you or your work if they'd like to, to know a little bit more? So I um, am woefully behind on anything to do with a website, uh, but I did with a number of years ago, I put together a project called the Veronica Franco Project, and it's housed on my university website, uh, not my university, but on the university website. I'm very happy to send you that link. And it's, uh, it's outdated, though, because uh, this is, was uh, I did this with a group of students. And then, you know, in the recent years, they haven't been updating it. Other places where you can find some of my more recent articles and things if people want to learn about those um, have to do, uh, and those have to do with the fact that my book was made into a movie. And the movie is about the life of Veronica Franco. It was a, it was a Hollywood movie called Dangerous Beauty. And it's a, it came out in 1998 and it was uh, mostly English actors in it, by the way. So that's a place for people to look and it's called, as I say, it's Warner Brothers, it's Dangerous Beauty. So that's a place, but as far as I, I've written some articles most recently about my role in the movie and, and the things that I liked and, and didn't like so much, but those have just come out in the last couple of years. And I don't know exactly how to tell you to access them. Um, one, I think, is an open access article. But if viewers look for Dangerous Beauty, the movie, I hope that they'll be able to find some, some mention of it. Wonderful. And I will look myself and add some links to our show notes just to make it easier. And I have not watched that movie. So there you go. I've got something <laughs> to do this weekend. I need to try and find it. Thank you again so much oh. for coming on the podcast and for being part of our All Things 16th Century Women special. I very much appreciate it. It was a wonderful time to talk with you. And thank you for such wonderful questions as well, because they really were 
the questions that were able that I was able to feed off of and uh, be able to get get inspired to talk to you about. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.